Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. Uh, this is a special Grand Rounds for us every year. This is the Reza Ganji Memorial Lecture. Um, Reza, whose uh, picture is on the poster, uh, was a remarkable uh, man who I had a chance to know and, uh, and several in the audience had a chance to know. Uh, Reza graduated from uh, Cal, undergraduate, and was already uh, very interested in an expert in ethics and policy at that stage. Um, went to Harvard Medical School, uh, came here where he was a Marshall and a Rhodes Scholar and studied in both Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, we were lucky enough to recruit him here to the residency program and uh, he was a uh, remarkable internal medicine resident both because of his clinical skills and because of his extraordinary interest in ethics and policy and uh, amazingly deep thinker. Uh, an incredibly interesting person, always kind of questioning the way we did things, and, and, and always I found in all of my interactions with Reza, he made me uh, think harder and better. Um, uh, Reza uh, uh, ultimately died uh, way too young, and uh, we have been uh, holding this lecture in his honor uh, since he passed away, and I'm thrilled that his family and many friends are here as they, uh, they come every year to help us remember uh, what a remarkable person he was and how lucky those of us who had a chance to get to know him uh, were for that opportunity. Uh, the lectureship that we have in his name is uh, we focus on issues uh, that Reza uh, cared about deeply and uh, often in the interface between uh, ethics and policy and kind of real issues that are confronting us in medicine that we're struggling with and those are the kinds of things that uh, he thought about so deeply. And, uh, and so we're thrilled uh, today to, uh, to be doing that. Uh, the speaker is Wiley Burke. Wiley is professor and former chair of the Department of Bioethics and Humanities at the University of Washington. Uh, she's adjunct professor of medicine and epidemiology and a member of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center uh, in Seattle. She directs the University of Washington Center for Genomics and Healthcare Equity. Uh, she received her MD and her PhD at the University of Washington, trained in internal medicine uh, there as well. I believe was an associate program director for a while uh, as well. Uh, she's really one of the leading thinkers in the uh, country and the world in what may turn out to be one of the most interesting and, and perplexing issues that we all confront over time, which is how to uh, manage uh, this uh, new information that we're all getting uh, in the genetics realm. Uh, in all sorts of domains, whether it's in direct medical care or public health or in research. Uh, she's a member of the Institute of Medicine and past president of the American Society of Human Genetics. And we're thrilled that she has been appointed the 2013-14 uh, presidential chair at UCSF. So she will be spending the next several months uh, in, uh, in San Francisco with us. So those of us, those of you who want a chance to work with her, I'm sure she'll love to collaborate with many people here. Uh, her talk today is called Practical Wisdom in the Era of Genomics. Let's welcome Wiley Burke. Thank you very much for that introduction, and it's an honor to be uh, speaking at a lectureship in honor of Dr. Ganji, who clearly was a remarkable uh, individual. Uh, I, I am going to talk about um, a philosophical concept um, that I, I hope he would approve of um, and a way to um, help us think about this indeed perplexing world of genetics. I want to start by setting the scene uh, and talk a bit about how we uh, have for decades now uh, been using genetic information in medicine and public health, um, we have a number of ways in which genetics intersects with our health practice. We do newborn screening. All infants in the United States undergo newborn screening to identify uh, genetic conditions that need timely treatment. Uh, we do carrier testing and prenatal diagnosis to assist with reproductive decisions. Uh, and we have a number of um, well understood and well described genetic diseases for which we provide consultation. I want to just pause and give you an example of one of those. Um, this, this is a what we call a pedigree a diagram showing a family, a father and a mother, a daughter and a son, and the son has vision problems. And he's been to the ophthalmologist. He has a retinal degenerative condition, uh, the name of which is retinitis pigmentosa. 
Uh, and it turns out that retinitis pigmentosa is a genetically complex condition. Something like 40 different genes uh, are associated with this condition. The progress can be variable toward vision loss, uh, and the inheritance within the family can be variable because of the different genes involved. Um, so although the diagnosis has already been made, a genetic test is useful. Uh, and in this particular case, this uh, young man has a mutation causing his retinitis pigno pigmentosa in a particular gene uh, that enables us to identify him as having X-linked recessive retinitis pigmentosa. That's important for prognostic reasons. We can predict with uh, a great deal of certainty that he's um, likely to be legally blind by the time he's 20. Uh, and um, that will have implications for his career planning, for his education, perhaps even where he chooses to live. Uh, unfortunately, right at this time, we don't have definitive therapy that will change the course of his vision loss, although we're already seeing research in gene therapy treatments that might ultimately lead to a, a better course. Uh, because it's X-linked recessive, um, his sister has substantial odds up up to 50% of uh, being a carrier for this condition and might also therefore have sons with this condition. So there's a variety of ways in which genetic testing can help and that's just one gene and a particular mutation in that gene. What we're now facing, what we now need to think about is the possibility of not just testing for a single gene but testing for all our genes. Um, so we, we now have technologies uh, that will give us a whole genome or a whole exome. As defined here, whole gen genome is nearly all, technically not entirely all, but nearly all the complete DNA sequence, all the genetic material of an individual, what we refer to as the whole genome. Uh, and the whole exome is actually a much smaller percentage of that DNA, but all the genes that code for proteins, proteins, of course, being the critical building blocks um, for uh, bodily function. Um, so what we're faced with really is uh, a world in which we're going from thinking kind of one gene at a time or maybe 10 or 20 genes at a time to 20,000 genes. And uh, what I want to talk to you about is the quandaries and choices and uh, both ethical and policy considerations that come as we, as we uh, enter into this new uh, technologic opportunity. I'll start by saying um, there are some early uses of whole genome, whole exome. Um, and uh, those are ways in which this technology is in fact beginning to enter the clinical realm. It is proving to be a very effective strategy for working up a very, very rare kind of patient. So occasionally we will see patients who have very unusual clinical presentations. One might think about a child uh, with developmental delay, congenital malformations, perhaps some cognitive, um, uh, other cognitive or neurologic uh, manifestations, and we're pretty sure it's genetic, but we've tested that 10 or 20 genes that we think are involved, and we haven't found an answer. Um, in something like 20 to 30 percent of those cases, and of course they're rare to begin with, a whole genome can get us to the answer. Um, so we're seeing it there. Um, we're seeing it increasingly being viewed as an efficient way to do concurrent assessment of multiple genes. So in fact, if there's 40 genes involved in retinitis pigmentosa, maybe we should be using this kind of technology to look at all of those genes in a single test. And also, still speculative but extremely interesting, is the possibility that whole genomes of tumor tissue may help us to understand the genetic changes going on in a particular cancer that will lead us to innovative cancer therapy. Still uh, really more in the research than the clinical, but we're beginning to see a transition there as well. So we have a lot of hopes for this technology. Um, but we also have the baggage, um, what we might view as the extra benefit, what we might view as the collateral damage. That is, if you do a whole genome because you've got someone with a, a vision disorder and you'd like to look at all the genes that are relevant for that vision disorder, you're going to get lots more information that you weren't looking for in the first place. Um, you're going to find out about inherited diseases and carrier states unrelated to the question. 
you're going to find lots and lots of gene variants that have variable degrees of association um, with both rare diseases and common complex diseases, and also lots of information that we're not quite sure what it means, lots of data that we can't fully interpret. And uh, here I want to step back and, and reflect upon the fact that information sits at the core of healthcare practice. That is, information um, is woven around everything that we do. Um, we start by gathering and assessing the relevant information for the patient in front of us. We then make recommendations and implement interventions, and then we got to see how they worked. We gather additional information to figure out how they work and start the new cycle. So actually processing information, making sure that we gather the right information, um, is really at the core of what physicians do. What is also at the core, hopefully, of good practice, of well-grounded practice, is something um, uh, that is uh, uh, a concept uh, originally developed by Aristotle, a concept called phronesis or practical wisdom. And I want to talk to you a bit about this because uh, what I want to argue here is there is a great need of phronesis as we think about how to manage the avalanche of information coming our way um, with whole genome sequences. Um, so. Uh, phronesis is uh, defined as the wisdom that is gained from experience and, it's very important, and morally informed mentorship. Um, to be a person of phronesis, practical wisdom, is to be the kind of person who in any concrete situation discerns the good and f finds the right way to achieve it. Um, those of us who've gone through clinical training have had um, the opportunity to uh, encounter extraordinary individuals who have phronesis, who have not only the accumulated wisdom of experience, but the accumulated wisdom of a morally informed uh, experience of finding the right thing to do in a particular situation. And arguably, this is a key element to delivering good practice. Um, and, and when we think about morally informed medical practice, uh, I think we, we, what we are thinking about is what is the good in front of us as uh, clinicians? Uh, that is the good of the patient. Um, so uh, what we're after here, um, what we are seeking that practical wisdom to attain is always very clear. Um, it is that fundamentally at its center, we have a moral enterprise in healthcare, which is to use the skills, to use the information, to use the knowledge that we have obtained, um, all of the competence involved in that in the interests of the patient. So back to that excess information, and I'm gonna re be reflecting as I go through the rest of my talk about the challenges raised by all this information and the insights, or my best effort to suggest what the insights might be from practical wisdom. Um, so here's a comment by uh, Dr. Leslie Biesecker, who's a leading uh, researcher in generating uh, whole genomes. He's been doing a very interesting study at the National Institutes of Health in which he has been doing whole genomes on individuals and offering them results. And in reflecting upon this experience, uh, what he noted was, obviously, as we've just been saying, that these genomic analyses generate much more data um, than we can in any meaningful way use. Um, and then he makes the interesting comment, clinicians are generally not likely to order tests that provide more data than they are seeking. And I think this is a little insight into practical wisdom. Why is that? Um, well, in fact, um, clinicians uh, uh, who are experienced, who have practical wisdom, pay a lot of attention to what information they need and what information they don't need. Um, and that certainly means being careful not to shortcut in the gathering of information that is essential. So we've heard in medical education over the past decade or so a lot of attention to 
uh, bedside rounds, to not shortcutting the physical exam, to making sure that we're training uh, medical students appropriately to learn the skills of physical exam. So when we're thinking about what information we need, we're certainly thinking about what we don't want to leave out. Um, but we're also thinking about avoiding shotgun testing. We don't just order everything. We think about what's the information we need, and we, we, we attempt to uh, elicit that information. There's also another piece, and I think it's central to the good care of patients, I think, I think we would all agree, and that is there is a source of knowledge that is crucial, even more crucial than the physical exam, and that is knowing the patient. Um, a very interesting study uh, was undertaken uh, over the past several years at Vanderbilt um, by uh, Larry Churchill, David Schenk, and bioethics colleagues there. Um, what they did uh, was they talked to 50 clinicians who were identified, identified by peers as true healers, as I would say clinicians with practical wisdom. Uh, and they talk to them about what is involved in delivering care. And what's really interesting um, is that when you read these interviews, um, competence, of course, is essential. It's understood that a physician must have competence because if a physician doesn't have fundamental medical knowledge, the physician has nothing to offer. But what these e healers talked about was other things that they identified as equally crucial to the delivery of care. And one of the themes was getting to know the patient. As you can see, listening. Listening is the most important thing. Uh, asking about them, not just about their disease. Uh, listen, 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 that's my mantra. Shut your mouth and listen. Um, so uh, I, I think um, w w as we think about a huge amount of information <clears throat> coming to us from the laboratory, <clears throat> coming to us from the DNA sequence, it's really important to reflect on the fact that it doesn't replace that crucial source of information uh, that comes from the patient. Now let's talk about what are the problems with loads and loads of information. Why is it that a physician will try to order, uh, a wise physician will try to order just what he or she needs and not more information than he or she needs? Um, it, it's really because of a phenomenon that's now been well described called the cascade effect of medical technology. And that is, as you gather more and more information, you increase the likelihood that you will generate incidental findings, ambiguous findings, false positive findings, and all of those findings have the potential to lead to actions, um, which might take the form of further tests or treatments, um, and all of them have the potential to lead to avoidable adverse effects. Put it another way, you, you see a shadow on the x-ray, maybe you didn't really need that x-ray, but you got it, you saw the shadow, and somebody wants to put a needle in to figure out what that shadow is, and there's a risk of hemorrhage, there's a risk of infection, there's a risk of <coughs> pneumothorax. So, cascade effect, and um, how does that, um, how, do, how should we be thinking about that <coughs> when we think about the genome? Well, <coughs> this is the risk of a whole genome. The risk of a whole genome is that there is so much information in it and so much information that is potentially ambiguous that the cascade effect is a very real concern. What I'm showing you here is just a brief overview of a very interesting study uh, in which a research team looked at uh, the data available from nine genomes that had been done on a research basis, and they just asked, so what's in an average genome based on these nine genomes? Well, on average, there are 3.8 million variants on average per genome, that's in all of us, of which uh, a little more than half a million are novel or rare. That means we've got to think seriously about whether they have clinical implications. Um, uh, they found uh, genetic changes, mutations that were predicted to have a deleterious effect in 136 different genes. Some of those were carrier states, but some of those were present in two copies, raising the possibility of a genetic disease. Now, at the same time, um, 
figuring out what a variant actually means is tough right now. Um, actually, my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Nussbaum, who's, who's here today, has been a leader in trying to uh, address this problem, which is a hugely important problem. How can we gather the information from the gene variants that we're discovering as we begin to do more and more genetic testing into a well-curated, readily accessible data source so that clinicians will know what variants mean when they find them. How do we do that in an ongoing basis? It's a tremendously important project. Um, we also, of course, have quite a bit of uncertainty about the penetrance, that is the likelihood of a clinical manifestation from many of the genetic changes we see. This kind of technology has a very high accuracy of testing in terms of how we're used to thinking about laboratory tests, but if you've got 3.6 or 8 million changes, a 99.9% .9 accuracy is still going to uh, generate um, error. Uh, and in fact, in the informatics analysis that was done as part of this study, um, the researchers predicted there would be false positive findings leading to potentially a false positive diagnosis in up to half of individuals uh, who undergo this uh, kind of analysis. So this information challenge is, is extreme, um, and um, we need to think about how to manage it. Obviously, the practical wisdom here is we need to be prudent about taking action. If we're generating information that has a significant r risk of false positives, we've got to be pretty careful about what our backup plan is. Uh, what kind of confirmatory testing do we need? What kind of information or how much of it do we get in the first place? And then how do we manage it afterwards um, so as not to go down the path of iatrogenic harm? <laughs> in other words, um, we need to think about uh, getting a genome as a three-step process. Um, the first step is getting the genome. Um, the middle step, a crucial one where tremendous amounts of policy uh, development are needed, is in what do we pull out of that genome? And in what circumstances? How much should that be context dependent? What do we pull out of the genome for a, an infant with a particular medical problem versus a healthy adult versus an individual diagnosed with cancer before we bring that information into the medical record, into the clinic, uh, and in, uh, into patient care? Um, we have um, an early indicator of um, of one way of thinking about this, and this is some recommendations uh, on reporting of incidental findings uh, from whole genome, whole exome, um, uh, from the American College of Medical Genetics just out last year. Um, so this was a, a recommendation statement that came from a, a more than a year-long deliberation of experts, uh, and what, um, what the recommendation uh, was is that whenever a whole genome or whole exome is done, um, uh, this group recommended that laboratories also look at 56 particular genes in the genome. Now, some of those 56 might be part of the reason the genome was done in the first place, but whether they were or not, um, this group recommended look at those genes. And why? Because these genes were selected as genes that were associated with high penetrance, um, severity of disease, and actionability the ability to do something. Um, I've given you some examples. Uh, there are several inherited cancer syndromes on the list, and there are a number of inherited uh, uh, cardiac syndromes, um, all examples of diseases where one might argue, you know, we'd like to know if it's there so we can do something about it. Um, and w what I think is really important about this suggestion is that it is operationalizing that selective policy of saying, you got the genome, you may have had a particular uh, uh, question that you wanted to ask of the genome, here's some additional information that's worth getting, but it's a pretty small amount, 56 as compared to 20,000 genes. Yes, we do want to be selective in what we pull out. Um, even here, though, uh, I, I will say um, that we need to be cautious about these recommendations, as I think this organization is being cautious. They note that there's insufficient data on clinical utility to fully support these recommendations, and they expect this list to change. So in other words, this list of 56 genes is the first cut. It's the best estimate at this point from a series of experts, um, but 
we still have work to do in terms of developing truly evidence-based practice. Um, what are the data gaps? Well, uh, a very important one is we may know what a particular genotype, a particular set of changes in a gene means in highly selected patients who come to clinic with a particular disorder and have that genotype. That's not the same as knowing how that genotype is going to play out in the general population. We know from newborn screening, in fact, um, that penetrance clinical and range of manifestations, the likelihood of disease is more variable when you go to a population-based sample, um, that in fact genetic contributors to disease have play in them um, and aren't also aren't always as fully predictive as we would um, like so uh, or as we think they may be so uh, we need to be cautious about that we need to gather data from population based sources um, and many of these diseases are rare and don't have controlled studies of outcomes of interventions we clearly need to gather more data if a disease is rare severe and there's a physiologically plausible treatment. We may not feel that we're ethically in the domain where a randomized controlled trial is appropriate, um, but we certainly need to gather high quality observational data when that is the case. So here's a suggestion of a selective way to pull information out of the genome, but we're still in early days in terms of research and an ethical imperative, I would argue, to gather that data, do that research, and to avoid a stampede. Um, we don't want to be pushed. We don't want to move too quickly. Um, uh, we don't want to let our enthusiasm get away from us. There is much to be enthusiastic about, and I want to talk about that uh, in a moment. Um, the, the, what this particular diagram is showing you is the range of information that comes from a genome. Now, we've already said there's a lot of data there that we don't fully understand, but among the data in a genome that we do understand, it's, it's across a spectrum of risk. Um, so so uh, we have rare diseases like those 56 genes uh, on the ACMG list, which are generally highly penetrant, as best we can tell, and most people, or perhaps in some cases all people who have a particular genetic change are going to get that, get that problem. Newborn screening is, is focused on those kinds of diseases. But as we go down the pyramid, um, we have uh, an increasing number of gene changes that contribute in some way, but interact very significantly with other factors like your diet, like your lifestyle or chance events or uh, other diseases that you might have. And at the bottom, what we have is a number of we many uh, variants that are weakly predictive of risk. We all have them. We all have dozens or hundreds of them um, that increase our risk a little bit or decrease our risk a little bit, um, but are not uh, uh, highly predictive of what our disease outcome is. And the question is, at what point and for whom is that information useful? What kind, in other words, what do we pull out um, of this pyramid? Well, um, as part of the enthusiasm out there, um, there's a lot of interest in the idea that we are heading toward a future of whole genomes for everyone. Um, here's a quote from a talk by Dr. Collins, a director of National Institute of Health, and he is confidently predict predicting um, that we're on our way. This talk was given in 2012, uh, and he said, um, five years maybe, 10 years, we're going to be in a future where everyone has a whole genome. Uh, and why, why does he predict that future? Uh, he believes that this is a way to empower prevention. Um, he's, in fact, very interested in all those weakly predictive genetic risk factors that might, as he puts us, uh, as, as he puts it, um, uh, enable us to pay the most attention to certain things, risks that we have, and perhaps less on others for which we are less at risk. That's where we need to go. Um, so let's look at um, what we can um, actually do what, when we're talking about genomic medicine as a screening project, um, that is, in the sense of testing to identify unsuspected uh, but treatable conditions. Um, the hypothesis here being um, that by identifying these, we'll be able to take action and improve outcome. Well, 
Here's one extremely promising area, and we're now talking about uh, dozens of genes uh, in the human genome uh, that influence how we metabolize drugs. Uh, and so there's a lot of uh, enthusiasm for the idea that we could identify people's pharmacogenetic variants uh, and use that in our prescribing um, uh, decisions. Um, and what we're going to be doing with pharmacogenetic information is pulling out outliers who either have a higher risk of adverse events to a particular drug and therefore should avoid that drug, or who might be non-responders um, and therefore should avoid the drug because it's not going to do them any good. Um, we're in the beginning of a very large research agenda. Uh, I think it would be fair to say that we have five or ten genetic tests that deliver on this promise with lots more potentially in the pipeline. Um, however, uh, per what I just said about weekly predictive, some of the changes in metabolizing genes are in fact pretty weakly predictive of uh, drug response. Some are more significantly predictive. And so there's going to be a winnowing process that we're going to have to go through to figure out when is the information good enough to pull into clinical care. Um, but here's, here's a dramatic example, perhaps we could say a poster child. Um, this is an association that's been identified between a particular HLA variant and the drug abacavir, um, which is a highly effective reverse transcript, uh, transcriptase inhibitor. Um, a small percentage of individuals um, have a hypersensitivity reaction to this drug. Uh, and in fact, it is such a severe hypersensitivity reaction that shortly after the drug became available, there was concern that it would have to be pulled from the market um, because of the, the life-threatening risks of this hypersensitivity reaction. One of the interesting things about uh, the genetic studies uh, on uh, and the testing studies for this particular variant are that they show us that a test can be useful even if the positive predictive value isn't all that high. Um, so what you see here is that the positive predictive value for having a hypersensitivity reaction if you've got this particular variant and are exposed to the drug is actually less than 50 percent, um, but the negative predictive value approaches 100 percent. Now another key issue aspect of the ethical dimensions of the use of this test is that we do have available alternatives. So what we have now is a standard of practice. Over the past um, maybe seven or eight years, we've established a standard of practice where um, the genetic testing should be done prior to prescribing a Bacavir, um, and if a person has the variant, they get an alternative drug. Um, so this is an example. Um, note, of course, that most people don't need to know this. Um, you only need to know this if you're facing a decision about going on a Bacavir. And if you are facing that decision, this information is only impor important to you if you're in that small subset of people who have the variant. Um, we're pulling out outliers, um, but outliers who will benefit greatly from this information, and all of us are going to be outliers of one sort or another um, uh, somewhere along the way. Okay, so there's a reason to be excited. Here's a little bit of a more complex example. This is a, 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 a slide from a study of some years ago, but it illustrates a fundamental point. Um, so this is a study that modeled the data that were coming out on three different genes, all associated with age-related macular degeneration. Um, and what uh, research in this particular area of genetics discovered is that these three different genes are all associated with risk of age-related macular degeneration. There were multiple variants in these genes, some increasing risk, some decreasing risk. So you could test for variants in three genes and get a lot of complex information. And you could use that information to distribute people across a continuum of risk. From um, a very tiny percentage uh, who are at extremely high risk of age-related macular degeneration um, to an equally small uh, percentage of the population that are at very low risk of age-related macular degeneration. And a broad swath in the middle 
that are at average risk or a little bit above average risk or a little bit below average risk. This is three genes. Think about what we can do with 20,000 genes. So the, the issue here, um, the, the, the fundamental issue is where do we draw the line? How do we even think about thresholds? Um, we first have to think about what is the condition and what can we do about it. And then we have to think about who needs to know who would benefit from this information? What we can do for age-related macular degeneration right now is we can tell people to avoid bright light. We can tell people not to smoke. We might want to tell everyone those things. Um, and then we can pick out perhaps some individuals who would get very intensive screening as they get to the age where age-related macular degeneration might start to occur so uh, we could institute therapy in a very timely fashion. Um, what's the threshold for that? It's not a bright line between those at risk and those who are not at risk. Um, we're going to need practical wisdom to sort this out. Um, we, we could also say down at the lower end of risk, are there people that we're going to say, ah, don't worry about it, smoking's fine? No, I don't think we're going to say that. So um, the, the question uh, of when is that reduced risk information helpful to people uh, is also an, a, an important question. Here's another example that um, just um, illustrates um, a, a fundamental issue with geno uh, genomics, and I've already referred to penetrance. This is just um, uh, a, a, an example on the continuum here. Um, this is a condition called SCAD. Um, it is screened for in most states in newborn screening programs. Uh, it's a particular fatty acid metabolizing um, uh, deficit. So individuals who have this condition uh, have a diminished ability to do certain kinds of fatty acid um, metabolism. And it was first described in the clinic um, and it was identified amongst kids who had a bunch of symptoms, developmental delay, uh, muscle uh, symptom seizure, behavioral, um, et cetera, a, a, a number of symptoms. And um, there were diet um, interventions developed to assist these individuals who have difficulty uh, with, certain, with digesting certain kinds of fatty acids. Um, but as uh, geneticists looked out to the families uh, of these children who were found, and as people have looked at individuals found on newborn screening, it turns out there's lots of asymptomatic, peop asymptomatic people with this condition, so much so that now we ha have to go back and say, was there truly a causal association between the genetic change and the clinical symptoms of those kids in clinic? There's a great deal of uncertainty about that. In other words, genetics is not simple. It's not a matter of bars and stripes and you get plaid. Um, there's a lot of complexity to it. And one of the complexities and one of the very significant harms of our enthusiasm with genomic information is the risk of overdiagnosis. This is a problem that's coming to be recognized broadly as a risk of screening. Um, the diagnosis of disease based on a screening test um, when many people with a positive result will be fine if left alone. Um, we have to be very concerned about that potential outcome of our enthusiasm for whole genomes. And in general, we can say that there's some practical wisdom here, uh, hard one, uh, hard one as a result of uh, problems that have emerged from screening programs, that screening uh, should be undertaken only when there is confidence um, that the result will do more good than harm because screening will do harm. Um, bluntly put, every adverse outcome of screening is iatrogenic and entirely preventable because we didn't have to screen in the first place. So I think as we think about the enthusiasm and the potential for pulling genomic information out like that HLA marker, we have to figure out how can we pull out the information that will be helpful and to the extent we can, avoid pulling out that which will lead to iatrogenic harm. And as we do so, we have to think about another harm of an information glut 
um, and that is that physicians are busy. Um, this slide shows an interesting study that was done asking the question, how many hours in a day would a primary care provider need to perform all of the evidence-based care that we now have available to us, um, modeling on the typical primary care practice, um, and using only evidence that was supported by level one, uh, sorry, interventions that were supported by level one or level two evidence, and you can see the answer here. To do it all, um, to do acute, chronic, and preventive, uh, you would need 23 hours a day. Um, now, there are two ways to think about that in terms of genomics. Um, one of them is, do we want to add genomics to this mix? Docs are busy. Um, uh, but we do have to think very seriously about the possibility that wise use of risk information might allow us to be more selective uh, in how we approach preventive care for different patients. We do, however, I would say, need to be worried that there's a big vat of glue hanging over us that may slow down everything we do. And how do we, as I say, pull out uh, what we need and avoid what we don't need? Um, because the more complicated we make it, the more error prone it will be. Um, Medical care is complicated. It should be complicated. We need to do things right, um, but we don't want to make it more complicated than we need to. And I think that is uh, particularly a concern when we talk about one aspect of genomic risk information that has received a lot of attention, a lot of excitement, and that is the idea that genetics might be a motivator. Um, and, and Dr. Collins himself tells a personal story that is quite uh, dramatic about uh, getting genomic results, finding out that he was at increased risk for type 2 diabetes, and that was the push he needed. That was the motivator um, uh, to, to work on diet, to work on exercise, to reduce his risk for type 2 diabetes. Um, that's uh, been a, 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 a uh, often cited hypothesis that one of the reasons we need whole genomes for everybody is that they will give us the push we need uh, to make the lifestyle changes that we actually know we need to make but just aren't making. Unfortunately, the data don't bear that out. Um, in fact, uh, we tend to eat and exercise uh, as our social, social circle, our social network eats and exercises, and it's not clear that intervening with genomic risk information is going to make any difference. In fact, if you look at the folks around this table, um, and you might like all of them to be eating and exercising in a healthy way, and perhaps they are, um, you're, uh, you're going to find people with very different genomic risks around the table, and it's not clear that you're going to get a good group effort going uh, if you're uh, dividing people up by genomic risk risk. Um, we need to know our patients. Um, we need to know from them what will help. And this is a, a final quote from the, the healers. Um, what's often not recognized is the patient brings a particular level of expertise. The patient is part of our expertise in sorting out what to do. Um, we need to bring patients in as we think about the relative value of genomic risk information versus other ways of helping people to pursue um, healthy lifestyles. Um, or. If you'll allow me to bend Osler a little bit, more important to know the patient who has the genome than the genome that has the patient. Um, I will end by saying genomics is a promising clinical tool. It's clearly going to be an efficient diagnostic strategy for people that come in the door and look to us like they have genetic disorders. It's going to make workup more efficient, more complete, and quicker. Um, it looks like it may be a potential key to innovative cancer therapy, and that would be a wonderful thing, um, but it's also going to be a rich source of risk information of varying predictive value and clinical utility, and our task is to figure out in that middle step how to put the right filters on um, so that the information that comes through to us is the information um, that we need um, and not the excess information that has very significant uh, potential to cause harm. No stampede, just a slow walk. Um, and uh, an acknowledgement um, from uh, another wise um, mentor, another person who's 
loss was untimely. John Eisenberg, who said um, technology is rarely inherently good or bad, always or never useful. What we have to figure out is for whom, when, how. Um, and that is our task in the world of genomics. It's a long road ahead, um, but it's one where we need to gather all of the practical wisdom that is in this room and other rooms like it um, to try and do this right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wally. That was terrific. Uh, let me start out with a question about 23andMe. You know, the inevitable 23andMe question. So there is a world of companies, many of them live around here, that will do this for you at decreasing cost, provide you a bunch of information and give you uh, uh, some data, uh, or at least what they call data, about your risk for various things. And I think it's been looked at various companies that do this and come out with wildly different risk profiles. Uh, the FDA said not too long ago that they couldn't do that, or at least market that. There was a moderate amount of uproar in some parts of the patient community saying, who are you to tell me what I can and can't have access to? I can interpret this stuff myself, of course, aided by the internet and all of the information the patients now have available. So I was struck by your slide about, you know, the patients have a lot of wisdom here. What is the role of us and experts in filtering this information, or should it just be available to people and let them uh, uh, buyer beware? Um, so that's a very interesting question, and I think very appropriate. I want to emphasize that I'm, uh, as I've been talking today, I've been thinking about bringing information into the medical record. And that's different from a consumer product. So let me clarify what, I, uh, what I'm thinking here. Um, so uh, what FDA told 23andMe is you cannot market a health claim. You are saying that this is good for people's health and you don't have the evidence to back it. And I believe that is factually correct. What we have is the, con and I think it's part of the internet dialogue that has flowed from that, is a conviction on the part of some people that they, first of all, want this information, but second of all, perceive it as helpful to them. And my guess is that understanding your risks of common complex diseases is helpful to some people and not to others. Uh, I don't think we have the evidence to bring it into clinical care and ask health insurers to pay for it. Um, I myself have no objection to consumers who wish to have that information being able to purchase it. But I'd like it to be labeled as, we don't know if this is good for your health or not. This is what it is. If you want it, go for it. Obviously, there's a sort of fine line, fine line between what's in and outside the medical record as the medical record and sort of consumer databases increasingly be morph into one thing. It's a real, real challenging problem. Uh, Dr. King. One of the things that disturbs me about what happens to this from our, as a scientist, generating this data, it gets out there in the public domain far sooner than it should. And I wonder um, how, how you think about what control should be put on what goes out there as being truth or available or the next great thing, because we give people the wrong information and then we backtrack you know, all, as, you've, as you've shown, we backtrack a lot. So do, do we actually have a role in defining what the New York Times can put on their health page as mm -hmm. the next great thing and control that? Because if, they, if we did something like that, it seems like we would slow down the inappropriate use or, uh, wait, like you said, it's not a stampede, it's a slow walk. Uh, how do yeah. we do that? I think that's a very uh, important point, and certainly genetics has been one of those fields where hype has been very prevalent. It's the gene for this, the gene for that, and the um, speculation about how that will lead somehow to a better treatment. Um, that, ha that, that kind of coverage has dominated the field. Interestingly, a colleague of mine, Tim Caulfield, uh, uh, at um, Edmonton, uh, Calgary, uh, did a study uh, of how uh, genetic discoveries are described 
by the media and how they are described by the scientists themselves. And he proposed in that paper that scientists are as much a part of the problem as the media, um, that the media actually tends to accu accurately report the kind of inflated promissory note kind of coverage that often uh, accompanies interesting scientific discoveries. So I think your point is well taken, and I think what we potentially could do is try and exert some discipline in the field, um, try and exert um, uh, a voice for evidence-based assessment. Um, there's lots of exciting stuff going on in genetics. It's really exciting, but most of it is pretty far away from the clinical care realm, and we need to figure out a way to talk about it that makes that more clear. When I, when I look at this wave that's coming our way, I mean, it is a huge tidal wave. And I guess one of the things I'd push you on a little bit is you show this model slide of somebody in the middle that's going to, you know, you know, sift through all the data and then feed it to the clinician, and then the clinician won't have to worry about being on top of things. And I, what I want... I want your input on is what do you think we need to do in medical education? I mean, I, I, I have the concern that in undergraduate medical education, we really need to retool and give every uh, MD in training the, the tools to even deal with this information, regardless of how well we sift it in the middle. Well, um, the sifting is not just informatics, it's practice guideline development. Um, and, I, and I think it would be a general, a, a fair generalization to say that um, clinicians have to process new information all the time and uh, new, new uh, interventions, new tests, um, uh, new diagnoses. Uh, genomics is obviously going to be a big part of it in the future, but it's not as though that's an entirely new problem. And when we look at what helps clinicians, it helps that there are trustworthy sources for guidelines where they know that a process has been gone through has been gone through that meets a certain evidence standard. And if we were to, first of all, make sure that our students are well versed in the ability to identify trustworthy sources and rigorous processes, um, that would go a long way because those rigorous processes take time um, and, and thought. Um, yes, of course. Um, uh, uh, medical students need to become more familiar with genetic risk information. And I, and I would say there's a conceptual piece that's most important, and that's the continuum of risk. So medical genetics has been so dominated by rare, highly penetrant diseases that it that view lends itself to a genetic determinist view. Um, and most of the genetics, most of the time in the future is not going to be that. I guess uh, one question that brings up, though, is is, is this fundamentally different in the data and the information overload it creates? So, you know, at some point in my life, I could remember, you know, high versus low blood pressure, high versus low cholesterol, glucose, all that. There's no way I can possibly ever remember, despite whatever education Mark can give his students, 20,000 genes and all of their derivation, and not even be able to interpret, you know, figure out where the guidelines are. Somehow that's going to have to be wired into a system. So. Where do you think we are in terms of the IT system's ability to handle this and pull the guideline at the appropriate place, or is that always going to be interme intermediary, some new person who is in the mix to do this counseling? I, you, I think you're making crucially important points. I can remember a mentor of mine in residency training uh, when I you know, very proudly told him what the aminophilin dose is, because that's what we were using then. And uh, he said, I, I don't even try to remember that, because I'll make mistakes. You know, I look it up, um, and 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 I think uh, so. I would say no. I don't think genetics is different, except in the volume of information that this big chunk that's coming our way. But I think this notion of figuring out ways to manage it for clinicians in a trustworthy way is really, really where we need to go. And as far as people working on it, I I mean, people are working on it, but they're at the beginning. Do you envision making decision making regarding patient care easier and, uh, um, and the algorithm easier to interpret? It's, there's a whole volume of information out there about protective genes, and I would think that that would make the, the, the big picture a lot easier 
in, in terms of in yeah, clinical I, I care? Yeah, I think that's the hope. The hope is that with protective genes, we can be more selective, in fact, about some interventions. So we might think about the fact that a panel assessing colorectal cancer risk would tell us who really needs to start colon screening at 40 and maybe a person who could skip it altogether. Um, but so far, we don't have, we don't see protective factors that have enough predictive value that they can have big impact on our common pre preventive interventions. We certainly need to be looking for that. And you could imagine other complexities like the protective gene says you're not at risk for cardiac disease, people stop exercising sure. or yeah. change the diet. I mean, that's what I would do. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you so much. That was, that was great.